Chapter 6 of The Life and Adventures of Peter Wilkins Volume 1 When we who were in the boat came to reflect on our condition, the prospect before us appeared very melancholy. Though we had at first readily enough embraced the offer, rather than perish in so much misery as we suffered in our loathsome confinement, we now judged we were above two hundred leagues from land, in about eight degrees north latitude and it blowing northeast a pretty stiff gale, we could make no way but rather lost, for we aimed at some port in Africa, having neither sail, compass, nor any other instrument to direct us, so that all the observation we could make was by the sun for running southward, or as the wind carried us, for we had lost the North Pole. As we had little above two days' provisions, we perceived a necessity of almost starving voluntarily, to avoid doing it quite, seeing it must be many days before we could reach shore, if ever we did, having visibly driven a great deal more southward than we were. Nay, unless a sudden change happened, we were sure of perishing, unless delivered by some ship that Providence might send in our way. In short, the ninth day came, but no relief with it, and though we had lived at quarter allowance, and but just saved life, our food, except a little water, was all gone, and this caused us quite to despair. On the twelfth day, four of our company died with hunger in a very miserable way, and yet the survivors had not strength left to move them to pity their fellows. In truth, we had sat still, attempting nothing in several days, as we found that, unless the wind shifted, we only consumed the little strength we had left to no manner of purpose. On the fourteenth day and in the night, five more died, and a sixth was near expiring. And yet we, the survivors, were so indolent, we would scarce lend a hand to throw them overboard. On the fifteenth day, in the morning, our carpenter, weak as he was, started up, and as the sixth man was just dead, cut his throat, and whilst warm, let out what blood would flow. Then, pulling off his old jacket, invited us to dinner, and cutting a large slice of the corpse, devoured it with as much seeming relish as if it had been ox beef. His example prevailed with the rest of us, one after another, to taste and eat, and as there had been a heavy dew or rain in the night, and we had spread out everything we had of linen and woolen to receive it, we were a little refreshed by wringing our clothes and sipping what came from them after which we covered them up from the sun, stowing them all close together to keep in the moisture, which served us to suck at for two days after, a little and a little at a time. For now we were in great distress for water than for meat. It has surprised me many times since to think how we could make so light a thing of eating our fellow creature just dead before our eyes. But I will assure you, when we had once tasted, we looked on the blessing to be so great that we cut and eat with as little remorse as we should have had for feeding on the best meat in an English market. And, most certainly, when this corpse had failed, if another had not dropped by fair means, we should have used fowl by murdering one of our number as a supply for the rest. Water, as I said before, to moisten our mouths, was now our greatest hardship. For every man had so often drank his own that we voided scarce anything but blood, and that but a few drops at a time. Our mouths and tongues were quite flayed with drought, and our teeth just fallen from our jaws. For though we had tried, by placing all the dead men's jackets and shirts one over another, to strain some of the sea water through them by small quantities, yet that would not deprive it of its pernicious qualities and though it refreshed a little in going down, we were so sick and strained ourselves so much after it that it came up again, and made us more miserable than before. Our corpse now stunk so, what was left of it, that we could no longer bear it on board, and every man began to look with an evil eye on his fellow to think whose turn it would be next, for the carpenter had started the question and preached us into the necessity of it and we had agreed the next morning to put it to the lot who should be the sacrifice. 
In this distress of thought, it was so ordered by good providence that on the 21st day we thought we spied a sail coming from the northwest, which caused us to delay our lots till we should see whether it would discover us or not. We hung up some jackets upon our oars to be seen as far off as we could, but had so little strength left we could make no way towards it. However, it happened to direct its course so much to our relief that an hour before sunset it was within a league of us, but seemed to bear away more eastward, and our fear was that they should not know our distress, for we were not able to make any noise from our throats that might be heard fifty yards. But the carpenter, who was still the best man amongst us, with much ado getting one of the guns to go off, in less than half an hour she came up with us, and seeing our deplorable condition, took us all on board to the number of eleven. Though no methods were unassayed for our recovery, four more of us died in as many days. When the remaining seven of us came a little to ourselves, we found our deliverers were Portuguese, bound for St. Salvador. We told the captain we begged he would let us work our passage with him, be it where it would, to shore, and then, if we could be of no further service to him, we did not doubt getting into Europe again. But in the voyage, as we did him all the service in our power, we pleased him so well that he engaged us to stay with him to work the ship home again, he having lost some hands by fever soon after his setting sail. We arrived safe in port, and in a few days the captain, who had a secret enterprise to take in hand, hired a country coasting vessel and sent her seventeen leagues farther on the coast for orders from some factory or settlement there. I was one of the nine men who were destined to conduct her, but not understanding Portuguese, I knew little of the business we went upon. We were to coast it all the way. But on the tenth day, just at sunrise, we fell in with a fleet of boats which had waylaid us and were taken prisoners. Being carried ashore, we were conducted a long way up the country, where we were imprisoned and almost starved, though I never knew the meaning of it, nor did any of us, unless the mate, who we heard was carried up the country much farther, to Angola. But we never heard more of him, though we were told he would be sent back to us. Here we remained under confinement, almost three months, at the end of which time our keeper told us we were to be removed, and coupling us two and two together, sent a guard with us to Angola. When, crossing a large river, we were set to work in removing the rubbish and stones of a castle or fortress, which had been lately demolished by an earthquake and lightning. Here we continued about five months, being very sparingly dieted, and locked up every night. This place, however, I thought a paradise to our former dungeon, and as we were not overworked, we made our lives comfortable enough, having the air all day to refresh us from the heat, and not wanting for company. For there were at least three hundred of us about the whole work, and I often fancied myself at the Tower of Babel, each laborer almost speaking in a language of his own. Towards the latter end of our work, our keepers grew more and more remiss in their care of us. At my first coming thither, I had contracted a familiarity with one of the natives, but of a different kingdom, who was then a slave with me. And he and I being able tolerably to understand each other, he hinted to me one day the desire he had of seeing his own country and family, who neither knew whether he was dead or alive, or where he was, since he had left them seven years before to make war in this kingdom." and insinuated that, as he had taken a great liking to me, if I would endeavor to escape with him, and we succeeded, he would provide for me. For, says he, you see, now our work is almost over, we are but slightly guarded, and if we stay till this job is once finished, we may be commanded to some new works at the other end of the kingdom, for aught we know, so that our labors will only cease with our lives. And for my part, Immediate death in the attempt of liberty is to me preferable to a lingering life of slavery. These and such like arguments prevailed on me to accompany him, as he had told me he had traveled most of the country before in the wars of the different nations. 
So, having taken our resolution, the following evening, soon after our day's work, and before the time came for locking up, we withdrew from the rest, but within hearing, thinking if we should then be missed and called, we would appear and make some excuse for our absence, but if not, we should have the whole night before us. When we were first put upon this work, we were called over singly, by name, morning and evening, to be let out and in, and were very narrowly observed in our motions. But not one of us having been ever absent, our actions were at length much less minded than before, and the ceremony of calling us over was frequently omitted, so that we concluded if we got away unobserved the first night, we should be out of the reach of pursuers by the next, which was the soonest it was possible for them to overtake us, as we proposed to travel the first part of our journey with the utmost dispatch. End of chapter 6 